Uh, hi, everybody. I am Krishna Subramani from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and I will be presenting our work on point cloud audio processing. Uh, so the short time Fourier transform or the STFT is a very common first step for all of us who work with audio signals. So what it basically does is it takes our input audio and maps it to a fixed size vector representation. But at the same time, this fixed size representation is what prevents neural networks from being repurposed for uh, data that has been obtained with another set of parameters. So for example, if I were to ask the question, can a model uh, that has been trained on one set of parameters, so let's say one set of uh, window length and hop size, can this model be repurposed to work with data that has been obtained with another set of parameters? So this is the question we want to answer. And uh, the idea behind that is to treat our spectrogram as a set of tuples, or uh, we borrow the term from computer vision literature, a point cloud, so a collection of points. So what, uh, from this figure, you can see if we have a magnitude spectra like this, uh, conventional models represent this as a spectral vector here, uh, but as a point cloud, we would just represent it as a collection or a set of these frequency magnitude tuples. Uh, so what we want to do is instead of representing uh, these as a vector of features, so we have a feature matrix. Uh, instead of that, we move to representing our input audio as a collection of low dimensional points, so a set of low dimensional point. And each point is essentially, like in the previous case, it could be the frequency magnitude tuple or the frequency time magnitude tuple more generally. And the thing to note here is we don't have to restrict ourselves to the magnitudes. It could be more arbitrary. We could have complex numbers or we could have the real and imaginary parts of the magnitude and phase. So uh, an important thing to note when working with such sets is that uh, permuting the elements of the set should not affect our output of the model. So they should be permutation invariant. And at the same time, we should have the freedom to add and remove elements from the set. And our model should not be affected by such things. Uh, so why shift to such a representation, you might ask. So consider this simple case of having a sinusoid, a five hertz sinusoid. So say I sample one second of this uh, at 100 hertz. So this is a 100 dimensional signal. And I take the DFT. So DFT will have a peak at the frequency index uh, corresponding to five hertz. And this, uh, since it's a real valued signal, it would be a 51 dimensional vector. At the same time, if I sample it, say at 200 Hertz, I would have a 200 dimensional uh, input signal and taking the DFT, I would still get a peak at the same frequency index corresponding to five Hertz, the same magnitude, but my DFT vector would now be a 101 dimensional vector. So the thing is we have these different dimensional vectors, but they encode the same information. So, uh, how to get over this, because the information embedded in both of these DFTs is the fact that this is a 5 hertz sinusoid. Uh, so more generally, how do we obtain such a point cloud representation from our audio? So we can start off with the spectrogram here. So what we have is a time frequency representation, uh, which is commonly represented as a matrix, an MN matrix. So each element is essentially a time frequency magnitude coordinate. So what we can do is we can collect all of those into uh, a set X, which is uh, each element is just three coordinates. So it's the frequency time magnitude and there are T such points. So this set of three dimensional tuples, the frequency time magnitude are, uh, is our input to the, uh, to the models we work with ahead. So currently we're working with the spectrogram, but more generally, you could, you could do stuff like reassignment to obtain more accurate coordinates of these locations. Uh, so the model uh, we choose to work with for sets is set transformers. Uh, so the main building block behind, the main idea behind set transformers is to compute self-attention on the input sets. So what self-attention is, is essentially it finds out those points in the input which are uh, important for the task we want to optimize downstream. Uh, so say, for example, we want to do classification, it'll find out those points in the input that uh, those, it'll attend to those points in the input that are important to classification. So 
uh, an immediate drawback of this is because it's computing attention has to compute uh, a distance between all the points in the input, which is quadratic in the input. So that could be prohibitively, that could be uh, expensive for large sets, which we might face. So instead of doing that, uh, what the authors here propose is an induced, is to induce or learn a lower dimension, uh, learn a smaller subset of K points from the bigger subset, such that these K points um, are chosen in a way to optimize your downstream task more efficiently. So this reduces the complexity from quadratic to n times k. And then uh, what this model does is to ensure permutation invariance. It aggregates or pools the information, again, using self-attention uh, at the final stage. So to contrast this with what we've been working with our, our standard feedforward net so far, to say we wanted to classify uh, input magnitude spectra, so our conventional feedforward models would take as input these vectors and the hidden representations would essentially be templates which correspond to the uh, spectra for each class. And then it would compute an inner product with these two templates and then pool them and predict them as class zero or one based on which inner product is the highest. So this forces, this inner product notion is what forces the inputs to be of the same size. However, if we treat our input as a collection of sets, uh, as a set of points, sorry. So what the set transformer instead does is it learns to pay attention to those points in your input set that matter for classification. So this frees us from the burden of having to work with these vectors. We can just feed in the information as a set, so as a collection of these tuples. And the set transformer will simply look at those points that are necessary to perform the task, which is classification. Uh, so what uh, we do is we perform classification on the ESC10 data set. So uh, we compare it with a simple feed forward baseline, which takes us into the spectral vector. And two experiments we perform to kind of demonstrate uh, why we can move, uh, demonstrate why to shift is the first one is we train on one set of analysis parameters. So we train it with one set of window length and uh, sampling rate, and then we test it with data which is from another, which has been generated with other window rate or other sampling rates. So the other experiment is uh, to see if we can subsample our data, only keep a fraction of our input data and see if the model's performance is affected by that. So our first experiment is to vary the analysis parameters. So this means is if we train say on a DFT of length 10, 24 points, and say I want to change the DFT to 2048 or 512. So with our feedforward baseline model, since it expects a vector of size 1024 as the input, can only, if, if I feed it smaller lengths, I will have to zero pad to match it, and I cannot feed it larger lengths. Uh, but our model, our set transformer model, is not constrained by such things because we are only feeding a collection of the points as the input. And at the same time, uh, for the sampling rate as well, uh, for our uh, for the baseline model, we have to we are forced to resample it to the training rate to ensure that the vector uh, encodes the same information. But for the set transformer, since you're feeding the tuples, it does not matter. So we can see that the set transformer is robust to both these increases and decreases in the uh, window length and the sampling rate. And second experiment is subsampling. So. Why uh, subsampling, you might ask? So say we have a setup where we don't have uh, the space to put all of our testing data. We don't have the memory. So in this case, we want to see if we can just keep a small fraction of our testing data and see if the model's performance is impacted. So the two ways we could do so is just keep the information corresponding to the loudest or the most energetic bins, which is the top magnitude points in your spectra. Or the other way is to just randomly sample across uh, the spectra and just choose randomly. So uh, uh, so this graph basically shows the accuracy of the, the model on test data versus the fraction of data we keep. So some interesting observations to make are with, our, with the set transformer model and random sampling, uh, we can actually just keep 40% of the data and see a minimal drop in the classification accuracy, which is actually quite cool. And uh, another interesting thing to note is uh, for the feed forward baseline model, uh, it expects you to have all the information. So if you give it less fraction of points, uh, it's not able to do anything. But the moment you give it all the points, it's able to classify. 
versus say the set transformer model where as you feed in more points, the classification performance improves. So that's actually uh, uh, strengthens our belief that the set transformer is learning to process these points individually as opposed to processing them in a vectorial manner. Uh, so the previous experiments were classifying spectral frames. So they were just frequency magnitude tuples. So we wanted to see if we could do the same with spectrograms. So we add the temporality and this is essentially corresponding to adding a time coordinate to a tuple. And for a baseline, we use like a CNN with the same temporal width as that of our set transformer model. And we see very similar results by varying the analysis parameters. And uh, for the subsampling, actually we see a, a very interesting result here is that we can actually just keep 20% of our uh, test data. So we can just keep 20% of the data and we see a very, very small drop in the classification accuracy, which is pretty cool. We just need 20% of our data to classify, uh, classify it. So why is this random sampling performing so well was the question we had when we saw these plots. So uh, our hypothesis uh, is uh, for this is that, so uh, uh, the network needs to see contrasting information to help it in discriminating amongst classes. So, uh, how we test this hypothesis is that, so say we have a signal uh, in the time frequency plane. So these two chirps here. So we sample points from the time frequency plane uh, in proportion to the gradients in the time and the frequency axis. So those gradients correspond to regions of change in the signal. So uh, what we propose is that the signal, the regions where the signal changes a lot are the important regions that help it in classification. And by sampling with this new procedure, which is this red curve here, we actually see that it closely matches the random sampling procedure. So what random sampling is, it's just a cheap and simple way to approximately find those points that help the network to classify the input data. Uh, so just uh, another note to ensure that we have fair competition amongst all our models. Uh, 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 by ensuring that the models perform similarly, uh, we see that the set transformer actually has less number of parameters than the, the, the temporal baseline, almost half the number of parameters. And at this, at this, with this half number of parameters, it's able to perform equivalently. But the caveat here is, uh, even though the parameters are small, uh, it has to perform more operations per iteration during training. So that actually increases the training time. So. A quick uh, kind of a solution we had to this was instead of subsampling during testing, why don't we subsample during training as well? So why don't we just feed it a fraction of the training data and see if the network can learn to generalize just by getting the subsample data as an input. And very interestingly, with just one sixteenth of the data during training, the network is actually able to learn how to classify uh, with a minimal drop in performance as opposed to using the entire data, which is actually quite cool. So our concluding thoughts from this work on working with audio as point clouds are, uh, we want to encode these spectrograms as sets of tuples. So frequency, magnitude, frequency, magnitude, time, or more generally, more generally neural features instead of these vectors that constrain us to work with these fixed sizes. So we want to move away from this fixed size mentality. And this, gives us some advantages which we just saw, which is the invariance to the training parameters. So you don't have to worry about stuff like the window length, the hop size, the, the, free, the sampling rate, because the intrinsic information in the signal is not going to change with those. So as long as the information there in the signal, the model should be able to classify that. And at the same time, we saw that the, the set transform models are smaller in terms of the number of trainable parameters. And uh, with our subsampling strategy during training, we can also get the added gain of potentially reduced computation, which can actually help in a real world uh, de deployment scenario. And finally, uh, this approach of uh, work of, of treating our audio as a collection, as a tuple, as a set of tuples instead of like fixed dimensional vectors allows us to pave the path for working with irregularly sampled signals. So we could have uh, signals that are sampled irregularly in the time domain or in the time frequency domain. And then we could, using this methodology, we could design networks that can work with these irregularly sampled audios. Uh, so yeah, that's all. Uh, thank you for listening and have a good day.